This is an 11 minute edited video where Bud Taylor speaks to the 90 executives at Korea Telecom about employee engagement. Thank you, GS, and uh, it's nice being back. It's always wonderful talking to the senior executive uh, group at, uh, at this organization. By now, I think most of you have been exposed to the methodology that we use. There are four lenses that we work on. We work on discontinuities, we work on customer insights, core competence, orthodoxies, orthodoxies. How can I forget orthodoxies? And what we do is we crash those four lenses, and that lets us see a future that we've never seen before. The question that we have for you as leaders is that when we see that future, when we see those new opportunities, what are you doing with it? And basically, if you're not engaging your employees, and if you're not listening to your employees, you're not doing much with all of that value. So let's start a bit at the beginning here. We know that employee engagement is generally low. In Korea, we see that those employees who are disengaged are about twice as many as those who are highly engaged. A fairly scary statistic, and maybe one behind a comment from uh, or Korean President Lee, who said that Korea has never produced a Mark Zuckerberg produce to achieving that future. Some of the strongest barriers you see there, we did a content analysis on your responses, and openness was one of the biggest barriers that people saw in KT for getting people involved and for innovation. You say that openness is a problem, and about a year ago, I was in one of your uh, operating units, one of your customer facing units, and I talked to a young woman. She was 28 years old. She'd been with KT for five years. And I asked her, uh, do you give your management ideas about how to improve your job, how to improve our relationship with customers? And she said, no. Well, I said, well, why don't you give ideas? And she said, well, when I got here five years ago, I used to give ideas but nobody listened and nobody cared. So I stopped giving ideas. So I, I was rather disappointed in that. And I, and I asked her, well, as a person, when are you passionate? What, what, what really brings your life together? What really makes you a person and wants you to get involved? And she gave me a couple of examples. So then I said to her, well, you know what it feels like to give yourself to something. When do you have that feeling? when you're at work. And she said, six o'clock. My great friend, the president of the Enterprise CIC, uh, talks about fish market management. He talks about what we really are trying to achieve here at KT. We're trying to find a place where people come together, they exchange ideas freely, and ideas, we know what happens with them. When you put ideas together, they bump into each other. They become bigger ideas, they become better ideas. So we want ideas in our organization to grow and to flow. We observe, but we don't see. Why does this happen to us? Well, the amazing thing is that our brains are highly efficient. Whenever we make a decision, we don't start at zero. We start from a knowledge base. Our brains create patterns that make our, our days efficient. If you had to sit down and think about every decision you've made to get here today, you couldn't get here. So our brain helps us get that done quickly. The good news is our brain helps us make quick decisions. The bad news is that our brain helps us make quick decisions. Why does that happen? How does that happen? This is classic work from two Harvard professors, Chris Ardress and Peter Senge. They talk about the ladder of inference. We all have this, even me, I hate to admit, but we all have this. We all run up this ladder very, very quickly. We get available data. Someone comes to us, they give us some information. We take the data and we select the data that we like. Once we select the data, we interpret it based on our beliefs, then we draw conclusions and we act. 
Let me give you an example. If you have an employee and you lent that employee to me because you really don't like that employee, you don't think they do a good job, and then you and I meet and you say, well, how is the employee doing? And I say, she's great. One of the best people I've ever worked with. Does the work well, very creative, very stimulating. But you know, sometimes she's late for work. The only thing you hear is sometimes she's late for work. Because that reconfirms your already, uh, the belief you already have. Well, our instinct is to go to conclusions. We always want to go to conclusions. We want to take action. We want to save time. We want to demonstrate our command of the situation. We're in command. We want to solve the problem. Okay? Why would you sit back and evaluate something that you already know? These underlying orthodoxies that I've observed in KT over the last year, these underlying orthodoxies shape the way you interact with your employees. They shape the way you run your meetings. There are two kinds of meetings that I see in this organization. There's one kind that's the predominant kind. And that's the kind that we've got here on this side. The usual style of meetings in KT is an advocacy style of meeting. The person who's the boss usually wants to take control, they want to demonstrate their knowledge, and they want to give the answer and give direction, because that's the way you've been taught. And to be honest, this is a much stronger in, in impulse in Korea than it is in any other place I've ever worked. So that's just naturally the way we want to be leaders. We want to be in control, we want to move things along. The rare kind of meeting in KT is on the other side, where you can see the boss, the leader, actually listen, summarize, and probe on the issue, and give guidance. Now, I've got to tell you, I've seen these kinds of meetings, and they're wonderful to watch. Mainly they're wonderful because it shocks the employees. Sometimes I've seen managers ask the backbench employees, come up to the front table, tell the other people, go, you, you go sit at the back table. <coughs> I've watched managers go around the room and say, what's your opinion on this? What's your idea on this? And the biggest thing I see is the employees are just surprised that it happens. So it can happen. I encourage you to have it happen. We need both types of meetings. But I think in KT, we can start using, it, using the inquiry meeting just a little stronger. So how do we do this? How do we engage employees by inquiring, by getting them involved? I'll give you two tips, two very personal tips for you. Number one, learn to summarize. When you're in a meeting, when you're meeting with your people, Learn to summarize. Most people, not me, but many of you, most people, when they're having a presentation, their only thought is, what am I going to say? They're really not thinking about, what is someone saying? So I encourage you, next week, take three or four meetings and say to yourself, I will not say anything in response until I can summarize back what the person has said. If you can't summarize it back, then you haven't been listening. And I guarantee you the one thing you'll learn is that you're a very bad listener. Managers are taught to be bad listeners. So learn to summarize. If you can get through that very difficult part of personal development, I'll give you a tip for the next week. In the next week when you go to meetings, only ask questions. Don't tell anyone anything. It's very difficult to take what we have in our mind as a direction and give it out as a question. So sit, ask the question. Why do we do this? Well, it's simple. When you're giving answers, you talk. if you ask a question, I've got to think. And that's not what I like to do with my boss. I want my boss to think. You 
ask questions, all of a sudden I'm thinking, I'm reflecting, I'm clarifying, and you give me the problem going out the door to solve. Okay? So two big things. Summarize and ask questions. Okay? When you're asking questions, I ask you to think about these two basic points. In any mode of communication, right now, I'm talking to you, you're listening to me, I'm not asking questions or programming, I guess I should be. Uh, but there's two kinds of communication that go on. Number one is facts. Somebody tells you a fact, my phone doesn't work. That's a fact, okay? You can't really start to solve a problem without knowing the fact. The other big thing is feelings. Every communication has a feeling behind it. People are talking to you because they're frustrated, they're angry, they're happy, they're inspired. If you can recognize that feeling, you go a long way to bringing the person into the country. At this point in the day, the 90 executives went into workshop sessions for a couple of hours.